I got called up and I mean, I was sent down a ton of times in my career. Yeah, and I there's a lot of times we were talking about this. It's easy to just, it's almost easier just to be like, yeah, you know, like victimize yourself almost. Right. And just be like, I'm done. But yes. you know, to, to get back up there, it's awesome what you did. Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I go back to that Oh six year and all those moves you made. I said, how'd you miss Tim? Right. right that's right. why, that's why right. I asked that college question. Yeah. You know, I was like, yeah. hey, were you not scouting college guys then? When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious and I don't care. <laughs> Freaking madman! Look at him going to town. That'll be a suspension. Jeff, uh, welcome to uh, the Raw Knuckles podcast. I want to introduce you to Tim Stapleton and Barry Reese. Barry is the producer and my partner in this. And um, Barry wanted to start off with a question because he got to cut out. He usually comes in at the end because he he just fucking never stops talking. So we're gonna let him start with a question. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna give me a chance to start with one question. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. Go ahead. All right. We listen. It's a great thing to have you on. We can't, um, at least from my personal point of view, it's really exciting to be honest with you. You get players, but it's great to have someone like yourself. So, here, here's the, here's my question. So back, and I know you. Okay, there I'm back on. Back in like 2008, 2009, my my son played hockey and he was struggling. So I thought his career was going to be over. So what I did was, and he had gone to Harvard. So I said, you know, if you really love hockey, maybe you should try becoming a general manager. So what I did is I made an Excel spreadsheet up, looked at every single general manager in the National Hockey League to come up with what is the best route to get there. And the three um, points or data points that stood out was one, you actually went to Harvard. So my kid had one, okay, which is hard to believe. There were like three guys that went to Harvard. The second um, was they played in the NHL. And the third was they were a lawyer. There were the three characteristics that seemed to give you your best shot. So I, at that time, my kid had not played in the NHL. So I told him, go get a law degree. So anyways, I looked at your, your resume. And it's it's unbelievable. Seriously, it's like... It's like my you baseball did. career. Oh, for yeah. Sure. So anyways, I wanted to get a sense of how you did it. Because I would have, if you were my son, I would have said, you don't have a shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, listen, I a lot of it's luck and being in the right place at the right time. I originally, when I went to college, I went to be, I want to be like an athletic director and a, and a, and a coach of many sports. Um, and then when I came out of college, there was no teaching jobs. So uh, people in my life had said, you know what, go to grad school. So I went to grad school and I started getting a feel for oh, maybe I could do something else and, and follow my passion for hockey. And uh, I just got an internship with the Bruins and then I had the right people there. And there was only in those days, it was like 11 people in an office, not 6,000. Right. So there was an ch- opportunity to do a little bit of everything. And uh you know, that's what I did. And I, you know, I was just in the right spot at the right time, had some really good people and, and got lucky. So yeah, hope for three for sure. But uh, somehow, some way uh, I'm still standing. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and some cer- certainly somehow, some way you end up being the executive vice president of one of the most glorious franchises in sports. Um, um, when I, I, I look, I, I want to go back actually. I love the fact that a Boston guy is up here in Montreal to square away the Montreal Canadians, get them on the right track. I I just, I I couldn't be happier for you and this organization. But that being said, I want to go back to when you're a kid growing up in Melrose, outside of Boston, just outside of Boston, and probably a Bruins fan. But but what sports did you, did you play hockey? Was it... I mean, I played every sport um, and uh, growing up in high school, I actually played football, uh, I played hockey and I played baseball. So that was just the way it was, right? You played, it's not like today where if you're a hockey player, it's 365. Back then there was no 365, there was no skills coaches and there was no availability of ice time, you know, in the, in the summertime, unless you had a, a ton of money. So, uh, 
that's just what we did. And then when we weren't playing sports competitively, we were outside and playing street hockey and playing on the ponds and doing all that. So that's the way I grew up. And, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I was a goalie, uh, and, uh, I always laugh and I, I, you know, everyone gets the, I talk to players, you know, I never played in the NHL, so I have a lot of respect for anybody that did or even any level, uh, but we all have a level where we, someone tells us we're done. Unfortunately, mine was when I was 18, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had to find another way up, you know, I was a decent athlete, but, uh, nothing that took me uh, to a high level. And, uh, but the passion was there for, for sports and hockey in general. And, uh, just kind of followed that. And like I said, mentioned to, to Barry early, just opportunity came and I just kept, you know, getting lucky and being in the right spot. And, you know, my father was a plumber and he told me that my first day when I went to work for the Bruins, he said, you be there before they get there. And when they leave, you make sure you're sitting there too. And, uh, that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I, how I tried to do it. Well, certainly good advice. No question. So you go to Bridgewater state, uh, you got a degree in phys ed, and then you got your master's at Springfield college in sports management. Uh, that's in 93. You were working for the bees, what, 92, 93, right away when you get out of school? Yeah, so as part of that program at Springfield for my master's, you had to do an internship. Um, so uh, so that actually counted as course credit. So I went there and I uh, was in PR doing a little bit of everything. Who opened that door for you, Jeff? You know, there was a, there was a, a, a guy that was with, there for the Bruins for a long time named Nate Greenberg. He was yeah, uh, Nate. You know, he's know sort Nate of Paul. Harry's right-hand man. Remember Nate? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he gave me the opportunity and then, uh, you know, it was sort of a good time, right? Like things were evolving in hockey where they were getting bigger and video libraries and, and arbitration and everything was getting bigger and they needed more people. And I, you know, just happened to be a kid that was out of school that could do some things with spreadsheets and some video. And, uh, you know, I used to go in late at night and tape all the late night games on satellite dish, you know, for the coaches and just do all kinds of things. So just a matter of getting in there and never saying no. And, and, uh, you know, for your hometown team was, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. The money wasn't great, but the, the, the opportunity was, uh, was pretty amazing. Was that internship involving you involved scouting in that? That's when you were scouting too, or no, no, not really. It was, uh, it was more in, uh, in the, uh, PR department, Tim, um, doing, you know, basically, you know, I'm sure you've been around a thousand of these people asking you to do things right. Uh, coming down after Chris practice. asked and, every day, Chris asked yeah, me to do things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. He's, Chris is your PR guy. So, yeah. Um, exactly. So it started like that. And then it was really, uh, Mike Milbury, uh, before he left, uh, Boston to go to BC in that short little window. Um, he had come to me and said, Hey, uh, you, you know, you, you say you like hockey, you want to be a hockey, uh, I have an opportunity for you to do some stats and some video for the coaches if you want to make a few extra bucks during the game. So that's really how that started for me. And uh, so I was doing a little bit of PR and then some stats. And then Mike O'Connell came in for uh, Mike Milbury, and it just kind of evolved from there. Yeah, did it ever evolve? And, uh, you know, looking at certainly your past there, you start as a scout, then you end up um, being um, – and assistant uh no a scout and then the director of scouting for a few years to uh assistant general manager the director of scouting again uh, everybody reports to jeff is that the deal and then you if you have certain players you actually go out and see each player or some of the better players that some of the other scouts are looking at when you're yeah, the so when it, when it first started with that director position, it was more like uh, organizing, getting everybody where they needed to go, you know, finding out who liked what players and then just uh, managing schedules and, and handling all that. Um, and then, you know, basically finding the, you know, on the amateur side, it's basically, you know, you had to see like the top 50 players and then you left everything else to the regional guys. So, it was really organizing and getting out, seeing the top players. That was a, that was pretty good. I, you know, when I first started scouting for those guys, uh, you know, Gordy Clark was there and, yeah. and John Rattel and Jerry Cheevers. So I had some, some all kinds of different people and some interesting characters. Uh, and Jerry was quite a character to travel around with and, and learn from. So, you know, again, you know, luck uh, to travel around with some Hall of Famers and, and learn the game that way too. Do you remember who the first player you kind of did a report on? Um, 
You know, I remember, uh, I remember they sent me out to see, like, he, I think he was like 15 or 16, but do you remember Danny Lacator? Yep. Yeah. So he sort of, a, he turned out to be a grinder, played some games. He was a local kid. And I remember they said, they sent me out with like a video camera, which I didn't know how to use. <laughs> and uh, I went out to see him and they ta- and I had to bring back a tape and then send it out to everybody because he was sort of a hot name uh, in the local area doing good things. So that was sort of a name that stuck out. Uh, but uh, yeah, Wait, you had to like, you were like running down up and down the ice with a camera. They were just like, yeah, like scout. So it, I'm a scout. It was, it, was, it was prep school tournaments and he was playing for like the old Springfield pits and yeah. they couldn't, you know, everybody couldn't be everywhere. So like, can you go down to Springfield and you videotape this guy and then come back to Worcester tape this guy. So they gave me like this camera and I go there and I, you know, I do everything from the warm ups to everything. And he, he was an interesting character and his family was kind of, they were big people, so I was like taking shots of the family to see how big they were. <laughs> I, I wanted to make a good impression, so I was like, "Look at the size of the family. This guy's gonna grow." And then, you know, wow. so I'm sure my I'm sure it was like moving pretty good, like the video. Right? <laughs> All right, so you hold that director scouting job for uh, five years, um, six years, whatever, and then you become the assistant general manager to who in 2000? Who was the GM there at the time? So uh, Harry had stepped aside as GM and became president and uh, Mike O'Connell became general manager. So you would Mike years. and yeah. yeah, for those six years and working with him, another local kid played for the Bruins. Um, and then uh, I want to go fast forward to 05, 06 and, and God, what a jumping off point. Um, Mike gets let go and you take over as interim. This is incredible. To me, and I'm sure a lot of people, you were the GM for 113 days. And what you did in those 113 days yeah. was built, uh, but not built, but drafted and, and made some moves to really set the foundation for that organization for the future. It was incredible, those 113 days. You had... Uh, Right, Luchik, um, Kessel, uh, Marshawn. You yeah. draft those three guys, and then and listen. I get it. The scouts are there, and the scouts do the work. But you're pulling the trigger, and then you go get Chara. You trade Raycroft for for Rask, and then you end up uh, coming up with Mark Savard. That's incredible work in that short span of time. Now. In your mind, are you thinking, listen, if I really do good here, I have a shot at maybe taking this interim tag and throwing it out the window? Well, yes and no. Like when I first started, you know, they they whittled it down. And right away, if you remember, they, they named Peter Chiarelli GM kind of early on. Um, so that we were down to like finalists and then Peter got the job. But the league ruled that he couldn't come in. Okay. The best thing that really ever happened to me is that I – I was able to have that experience because they wouldn't let him come in. They wouldn't let us talk to us until after in somewhere in August. Yeah. So because of, you know, he was down the road with Ottawa and knew their lists and all that stuff. So he had to stay and commit to there. So uh, I knew I wasn't getting the job, uh, but uh, yeah, the draft, obviously we had a top pick, right? So Kessel was the fifth pick overall, but, but the guys, uh, you know, you know, what a, what a draft that set them up forever. Right. So uh, Luchik and, uh, and Marshawn too. So, um, and that was the, you know, what's funny is on Raycroft, it, it really was a, a, you know, Toronto had called me the day of the draft and said, Hey, we really want to get Raycroft. Um, would you be interested in one of our two goalies? So really my hard work was talking to our guys, getting the right guy because they had Justin Pogge who had just won a gold yeah. medal in Canada. And he was a really big name. And, but the, the good part was the year before we wanted to take Rask and we knew Rask. So that was, that was pretty good. So sometimes it's just a matter of the phone rings and you're like, just don't screw this up. You know, <laughs> were college guys at that time? Cause Kessel was a college guy Were they kind of look, um, you know, or I guess, you know, looked at like it's bigger today with college players, right? There's more and more college players, but yeah. Yeah. That time oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Well, those, you know, Kessel was, there was a lot of college guys at that time. Right. So right after that, like Parisi there, there was, there was guys, right. So, they were starting to, you know, maybe 10 years before that, it started to be a, a big thing. 
Now, looking back at that and grabbing a guy like Kessel, we know the career he had. We know he gets knocked because he's weight and this and that. He likes cheeseburgers, but um, who doesn't? But why so short of a career there? I often look, I, like I looked at um, Kessel, and we had someone on yesterday taped with him, Blake Wheeler, guy who signed with the Bruins, and those two guys are gone. I looked at that, and I'm there, geez, Kessel, what a player. Blake Wheeler showed great promise as a young player. And, and you know, you work for Boston. You got to be a Bruin. If you're not being a Bruin, the exit's pretty close. Yeah, I think that's a part of it, right? You you know, the style of the player, right? And you're drafted fifth overall, so expectations. But, you know, Phil was a really good Bruin. I, I think what happened, and I was gone at that point when they made the trade, but they made a pretty good trade that, that uh, set them up pretty good, right? They got Sagan and, and uh, Dougie Hamilton out of it, right? Yeah. So they ended up getting two first-round picks, and I think Toronto probably didn't have an idea that they would be a lottery team. And so they ended up making a really good deal uh, for Phil, even though, you know, so I think they didn't, probably didn't want to get rid of Phil, but there was contract things, I think, at the time. And then uh, you know, they were able to get Sagan and Hamilton, which worked out pretty good for him. Yeah, it did. And, and again, um, looking at all, all your time there with Boston and, and doing the work you did. And another scout there, Daniel Dore, you and uh, Daniel were let go a year after Shirelli is there. What happens there? I mean, you have like yourself who did what you did for yeah, the organization. Was that a personality things. clash or because yeah, yeah. you got it done? Yeah. I think that's, that's part of it. I think when Peter came in, you know, he, he wanted his own people. Um, it was his first time GM. He, he had his own people in mind. Um, and he started hiring some people around me right away. And, uh, you know, I, I, listen, I, I think in the end of the day, it, the summer I was able to have as interim GM and, and kind of set it up that way. So, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, the general manager comes in and it was set up that way. Maybe, maybe he wanted to change this. Let's, let's just get a clean slate and, you know, he did some good things, but, you know, maybe uh, it's time to move on. So w what I did is I, as that year went on, um, you know, we, we probably weren't the most compatible moving forward. So I, I basically told him I'm, I'm going to leave. Um, and he said, okay. So that's, that's basically how it happened. But so, I, you, you know, you, I could you, tell right away that we probably weren't going to be working together a long time. Listen, I want to be a general manager. I wanted that job. Uh, I would probably part of it was on me too, so. Yeah, which is cool. Uh, you know, I, I I certainly admire that. You know, sticking to your guns and and feeling like you, you're certainly capable, and it's not going to work out there. You make that move and tell them you want to go. I I think that's awesome. A, a lot of times, people just sit tight and wait for it to happen, yeah. and that's I don't awesome. Know my wife liked it, but you know, I, <laughs> well, I, I so you end up trying to do something different. <laughs> You end up with the Rangers. Uh, what, was Gordy Clark with the Rangers at the time? He was. He had yeah, moved he had on, gone, right? He had gone with Mike Milbury to the island. Yeah. Right? And then he left to go to the Rangers after that. So, yeah, he, he actually was a couple years before me. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a big big part of pushing Glenn Sather to get me there. So, uh, you know, he's Gordy's been a big part of my my career. You know, somebody I look to as, as a sort of a mentor and, and a really good friend. has been really good to me. Yeah, I like Gordy Clark's awesome guy. He was assistant coach when I was with the Bees. And We're actually bringing him on to Montreal. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, good stuff. That's this, awesome. This is probably an announcement. Yeah, just breaking news. Should we... <laughs> awesome. Um, breaking news on uh, so did you When you went to podcast. New York, did you go back to, like, uh, scouting? Like they, cause you, so, like, what did that – like, did, were you videotaping again? or were you... Yeah, no, basically, <laughs> you know, it's, that, it's like that. I, I left – I was – all of a sudden, in, in one year's time, I was, you know, I guess, interim GM and uh, uh, assistant GM, and my career looked pretty good, I thought. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, they make a change, and and uh, and now I, I, you know, I just I knew I wasn't going to be there any longer, so I, I put myself out there, and and I couldn't I couldn't get a job at that level right away. Um, jobs were taken, you know, it was uh, it was late in the summer, and uh, so. I, I did. I went back, and that's where my wife was like, "Okay, this might be the time to, you know, 
do you have any kind of skills in a trade or anything? <laughs> they were like, let's, let's start paying for our kids' bills and everything. So uh, that was a tough one to go back and, uh, and just basically be a scout for a year. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it worked out pretty good. I, I got back on the road, um, you know, part of one of my biggest passions in, in this business is doing that and, and scouting and following the players and being, and being on the road, seeing it, being part, you know, being out there in it. Uh, so it kind of got me back to my roots a little bit. And, and, uh, and the Rangers got to see that, you know, that I, that I might know a couple things and that, uh, so they just well, you can also relate to a player to kind of gets called up and sent down. Yeah, a little bit. Absolutely. Like, right. Like, I think that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that was tough. I, I look back and I'm like, wow, you know, that I, that I went, so I went, you know, it felt like I, I got hit over the head a little bit. Right. Yeah. I got called up and I mean, I was sent down a ton of times in my career. Yeah, and I there's a lot of times we were talking about this. It's easy to just, it's almost easier just to be like, yeah, you know, like victimize yourself almost. Right. And just be like, I'm done. But yes. you know, to, to get back up there, it's awesome what you did. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I go back to that 06 year and all those moves you made. I said, how'd you miss Tim? Right. right that's right. why, that's that's why right. I asked that college question. Yeah. You know, I was like, yeah. hey, were you not scouting college guys then? Well, that's a, that's a big part of our business is, that, you know, when you make when they make a good pick, people talk about that. But there's there's more misses. You're going to well, miss a lot of guys. Right. And yeah, yeah the late sure. blooming thing and everything that goes into it, uh, the characters. So it's a uh, it's there's no perfect way. Right. Yeah, no question. Now you worked under Glenn Seda, obviously, and then uh, you end up uh, taking the reins there as general manager, and uh, along with uh, President uh, John Davidson, right? Was or was Slats a Seder at? Was Slats? The yeah, guy so at Glenn the time? was. You know, Glenn was there since two thousand, um, and then we had gone to the Stanley Cup Finals uh, against LA. Um, in in after so I moved down there in uh, I think ten or eleven um, to take the AGM job um, and then um, you know Glenn at that time was getting closer to the end as being a general manager he wanted to move on um, so once we went to the final pretty close to after we went to the finals he stepped aside and then uh, named me GM and then he was president for a few years and then and then they brought in JD back you know, for a couple of years yeah. So uh, your time with the Rangers now, your uh, general manager, J.D. is there. And um, uh, we look at, um, I, I want to go back to when you guys come out with that statement before the season saying, listen, we're going to make, uh, whose idea was that? Was it you and J.D. or you and oh, so you're letting the, the fan the, base know? The, the letter? Yeah, the letter. Oh, oh, the rebuild letter. Yeah. Yeah. But J.D. wasn't there yet. So Okay. I was telling this story last night. So, uh, you know, we had a, we had good teams in, in New York, um, but we were always we were always pretty much against Pittsburgh and Wash, right? There, there were the there were the ones that we had to pr pretty much beat or, on our side. Um, and you know, we went to the finals. We went to some conference finals. Um, you know, had a lot of success. But it, it got to the point where if, if you looked at our team, um, uh, we were good, but we weren't great. And uh, we were missing a few things. We had a really good goalie. We had some really good things. But there's just teams that were better than us. And that was the reality. And we started having conversations the previous summer um, with uh, Jim Dolan just to say that this might have to happen. And uh, that's sort of the start of it. And then this, as the season went, went on, we were about a 500-ish team in, uh, in February. And I remember we were in Dallas and uh, – we really never touched the puck one game. And uh, the next day I got a call. We're getting on a plane saying that when I land, I have to go see Mr. Dolan, <laughs> Lane Vino and him. So I was like, okay, that's not a very good call to get. <laughs> yeah, so, I guess. Uh, we landed and there was a chopper waiting right next to the plane. Um, and all the players looked at us and I swear all the players like, see you later, Gortz. Nice going, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> And so we got on a we got on a chopper. We flew right down the river, and uh, went downtown. And 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 to his credit, Jim Dolan was there waiting to have the conversation about the rebuild. And a lot of it was, you know, he backed it all, um, and I give him credit for that. And uh, so that's that's sort of that meeting that we probably spent two or three hours in that room and and came up with a plan uh, of what we were going to do. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, a few days later, I was, uh, I was in front of the media saying, this is what we're doing. And then we did it, right? We, we traded a lot of guys. So Yeah, yeah. and uh, certainly made some great moves and got that team set and going in the right direction. Um, Jim Dolan, uh, again, um, I saw Jim Dolan. Last time I saw him, he was playing um, uh, in a band before the Eagles concert, and he was brutal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I like the Eagles, but Jim Dolan, I didn't want to hear him that night. Anyway, uh, enough said about that, but it, it, looking, so you do the, re, start this rebuild, you, Panarin, you get some great players again. You're, you're, you're putting this whole thing together. And um, I want to get to the incident, obviously the incident against um, I, knew a guy like, I knew a guy like you couldn't pass on the incident. <laughs> yeah, no, shocker, wow. right? Shocker. God. He wasn't yeah, going to talk you. about, like, goals and stuff, was he? Well, no. <laughs> what would you have paid to be on the ice that night? Oh, I would have loved it. I would have been – I would have yeah. done it for free. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. And – I could have used you. Yeah. And certainly seeing that happen, uh, obviously, I piss a lot of people off. And, and really no one to respond there. And that was – that was tough to watch because the team at that time didn't have a guy like Reeves who could step in. And, you know, I looked at, and I go back to when Reeves was in Vegas, he challenged. And what, what I don't like about tough guys that pick and choose when they fight and Reeves challenged Wilson in Vegas. And Wilson said, no, kind of like, I'm not going to waste my time with a guy like you, which pissed me off. I'm there. I lost some respect for the kid. I love, he could play. He's a great player and all that. But then what he did to Panarin, and I've done some things that, you know, I wish I didn't, the whole Middleton thing back in the day. But this this was, was tough to watch. If this kid hit his head, Panarin, you know, he's, <laughs> you know, a young kid coming in the league, and this happens to him. I mean, he's been there a few years. But what was the sentiment around the team, and, and what were you going to do about it as a, as a GM? Yeah, listen, I, you know, listen, I'm the general manager and we didn't have somebody f to answer to Wilson. There's no doubt. So, you know, that falls on me. I, I don't hide from that. Um, you know, we're, we're rebuilding the team. We're in the middle of a rebuild. And one of the things when you rebuild and you have high picks like we did, right, with uh, Lafreniere and Kakua and some of these guys is we basically made the commitment to play them, right, through everything, Heedle, all of them. And sometimes – when you're building a team, it's easy to put on the board and say, we need this, we need the fourth line guy, we need a role player, we need this, this, this. We just weren't at that point. And our philosophy was these guys needed to play. We had, you know, it's not like we didn't have some tough guys in our team. We just didn't have anybody who could handle him. And it got out of control and, and you know, life lesson learned that, that uh, you know, don't put yourself in that situation for sure. Um, but if you look back on that night, we have, we probably have like 10, 22 year old players or younger in our lineup. Right. So it was, it was, you know, it was kind of like that, but it was never really a problem during the season. It was only with a few games to go that he ob obviously did that. Right. Um, and uh, so it was, it's people always say, did you lose your job because of that? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's why. Um, I just think that, you know, somebody that owned a hockey team decided he wanted to make a change. Um, you know, if you look at the body of the work that we had there and you looked at the season they had after I left, I, I think that uh, the Rangers are in a pretty good spot. And, uh, you know, so I don't think that – I don't think Jim Dolan woke up one day and said, what happened last night? I'm firing these guys. I just think it happened, you know. Well, the thing is, it's, it's hard to understand because you guys come out with a statement saying this guy should be suspended and – there was talk about Paros, uh, this guy should be replaced and all that. Did What was the friction between yourself, J JD, and the owner? There, yeah, there, so, there has to be something there, right? Yeah, so obviously the owner was upset about uh, about what happened um, and wanted, wanted him suspended. And then uh, he basically had the PR department write a, a statement asking for something things and he never he never said anything to JD and I about it they just did it so you know 
I didn't really necessarily have a problem either way, but I would, as a general manager, would like to have a conversation about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So once that thing, once that release came out, JD and I said, you know, we're probably in trouble here because we didn't know about it. Right? So here's the deal that comes out now, knowing you the short time I've known you and I've known JD since back in the day. Um, you probably wouldn't have put that statement out. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. I, I uh, listen, I, I have a really good relationship with the league and the people that work there and I trust them and I don't, you know, I don't think it's George Paros's fault that what happened on the ice that night. So I don't blame him. Um, you know, I, I look in the mirror and say, you know what, next time, you know, when we have young players, we're going to protect them pretty well. But I, I don't blame the league on that incident. Um, so I would have handled it. I would have rather have handled it in, in-house, you know. And, uh, yeah, so that's a uh, – There's not many teams that – out, but there's not many teams. There's a lot of teams out there that can't ha- – there's someone can't handle Tom Wilson, though. I think yeah, teams, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, and, and you guys exactly. played him – the next time you guys played him, a guy stood up. You know, Smith it, fought him. Did. Guys – there's, there's was, a lot of guys in that team yeah. that, that, that can handle themselves fine. Tom Wilson's a, you know, he's a, he's a rung up from all of them. But, you know, no one can convince me that, you know, Jacob Trube is not a hard player to play against that doesn't stick up for his teammates. You know, you can't tell me that, uh, you know, Lindgren isn't a hard player to play against. You know, uh, you know Rooney, a kid from Boston, he's not a fighter, but he's not afraid. Uh, you know, we had guys that, that were character guys. It was just, it's something that, you know, Wilson did a stupid thing, right? And he, and he chased down and he, and he went after a star player in the league in a way that you don't see very often. And, uh, you know, that to me was a little bit of a respect for the game thing. And, you know, run his head in the ground like that, you know. I don't remember the last time you see that happen to a star player from somebody like that. So, uh, you know, you keep using the phrase perfect storm, but it, it seemed like it was that that night, right? You know, and then. Oh, the way he conducted himself in the penalty box and the whole thing it was it was a bit of a charade, right? And, and you uh, pulling certainly before that all happened, pulling up that deal for the trade. What was the t- trade for Fox? Oh, well, Fox was uh, yeah, so uh, incredible Foxy, deal. Yeah, so Foxy had been in uh, drafted by Calgary and already traded once, and as he got closer to the the luxury that college players have of free agency. You know, if you're four years out from draft, you know, he started figuring out, you know, him and his agent that I could play where I want to play. And uh, it started, you know, we started doing the math and, and figuring out that that might be in New York. Uh, so just talking to Donnie Waddell, uh, working out that deal, you know, he had wanted a first. We went back and did a few things. And then I called actually Teddy Donato at Harvard, uh, who played for me as a great guy. I asked him, he said, what are they asking for? And I told him, you know, probably a second and a third. It might be two twos. He's like, then why did you hang up? And uh, so, you know, that's that's basically, you know, I, I, we all loved Adam Fox and what he could do. The only question really was because he had played 35 minutes a night in Harvard, people thought he couldn't skate. You know, you go there and you see a, an elite, elite player just keep going back out there. You start thinking, oh, but he was tired, right? So, uh, and he ends up winning the Norris Trophy. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, a, yeah, unbelievable deal. Now, I want to get into the 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 Habs. Uh, you be, the, when do you get the news that they want to speak with you? Here you are, uh, coming up to Montreal Canadiens, and they're looking for you to be uh, part of this organization. How shocked are you? Obviously, growing up in Boston. Boston guy, you know what we thought of Montreal back in the day. We hated the Canadians. Yeah, there's a healthy respect. Then all of a sudden, here you are, this Boston guy. Now you're going to have an opportunity here with the Habs. What, um, were you shocked at that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even today, sometimes I'm still shocked, right? It's a, you know, this is, this is the, it's an unbelievable franchise. It's a, it's a great city, but what this franchise has done and what, what it's, what it means to the NHL, what it means to the city of Montreal, it's, it's crazy. So just as, as in a shortest way possible, I, I, you know, I'm basically a free agent. I'm working some TV doing that NHL ne- network gig. Right. And, uh, and I talked to a couple teams about some things and, and uh, it just didn't seem to make sense. And then one day, you know, my wife and I are at lunch and my phone rang and I looked and it was a Montreal number. And I was like, I don't know the number, so I'm not answering. Right. So, I'll let it go to voicemail. And I thought it didn't go to voicemail. 
So I got home and I looked, I had this feeling that maybe, just maybe that might be Montreal, somebody important. So I, I looked in my book when I got home because I didn't have uh, Jeff's number. And, uh, and I looked down and sure enough, I, it was Jeff, it was his number. And I'm like, oh man. So then I said to my wife, I, I think the Montreal Canadians are looking to talk to me here. She's like, yeah, right. Like no one would believe that, right? So that's sort of how it started. Um, and, uh, you know, it evolved from there and having a few conversations with Jeff and everything. So, uh, but even to this day, you know, not even, I guess what, nine months later, it's still hard to believe that, you know, I never really thought, you know, I, you always think of Montreal as, you know, there's, there's, uh, that would be too hard to, to, to have that opportunity. Right. Yeah. Listen, I, I happen to think, and I, listen, I know when Jeff was looking, um, he talked to my former left winger and my uh, former left winger, pretty intelligent hockey man. And I happen to think he came up with your name and, and you end up coming up here for that interview yeah, and you end up getting the job. I think people were shocked, like, cause you know, here we, people are thinking, oh, you gotta be bilingual, but they name you executive vice president and then you got to go out and find a GM now. Um, how was that for you? Because before you didn't have to deal with the language thing, no problem. But now we need a coach who's a, uh, um, not just a coach, a, a GM that you can work with that speaks French. Now, um, did Hughes, Jeff Hughes come to mind right away or did you have some other guys you're thinking? Yeah. I mean, that's different, right? So right away, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the bilingual piece, right? Yeah. So, it limits you. Yeah. So, you know, so that right away, you, you try to put a, together a list and we had a committee um, that Jeff uh, and Bob Ganey uh, and Michael Anlau are all on. And uh, it worked out really well because everybody had some names and, and uh, it was a big help for me because a lot of those people we interviewed, I, I didn't really have any history with and, and some of those guys did. So it really helped. Uh, but yeah, can somebody that I've known in the business a long time and spent a lot of time on the phone with talking hockey um, and always enjoyed our conversations and uh, in a lot of ways he drove me insane and, and, uh, but I knew that he was a good hockey guy and, uh, but very opinionated and, uh, you know, he had that kind of mentality that I thought one day could, could do that. Um, but initially when I, when we built out the list, you know, he, he really wasn't on it because I talked to him and he didn't seem like ready to give up his business. And there was a lot of pieces there that had to happen for him to come. So we just kind of went on our way and interviewed, you know, there's probably, I think 10 to 12 people and really good qualified people. And, uh, you know, as it went on, um, you know, it went on, it was probably six weeks towards the end. I talked to him again and I'm, and I, I could feel that he was turning a little bit towards, towards maybe I, I might be missing an all time opportunity here. Um, so, that's when I felt I had talked to Jeff and I said, you know, I, I think we should talk to him and, and see what you think. He didn't, he didn't have any history with him. So, and then he, and then he took like sort of a first interview and then, you know, the rest obviously is a little bit of history, but yeah, but that was a good process. I really liked a lot of the candidates and uh, very unique to have the, that, that French speaking part of it, you know, Knox, so. were you on that list? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I just couldn't, um, I couldn't find you. He doesn't know <laughs> French yet. So. Not bad. Yeah. I've heard him. Yeah. Peu français, un peu français, Tim. Um, so you bring in um, Jeff Hughes and it, it, you know, the two of you working together, just, just things look awesome. And then, okay, now we got to go find the coach and the coach has to be bilingual, not to speak to the players, but to speak to the media. We get it. Um, and then, and listen, to, totally off the, off the board. And I say that because a lot of times, right, we go and get coaches who were here before and they're the retread coach. he have been around forever. We got to go with this guy. And you guys come up with Marty St. Louis, who, listen, bright guy, great career and all that. Um, but he was coaching kids, never coached American League. Or anything. And all of a sudden he's coaching the Montreal Canadiens. How do you two come to that decision? <laughs> Well, we both, what's funny is we both kind of always thought of Marty as would be a great NHL coach. We always had those conversations and, and uh, I had history with him as a player. We traded for him, brought him to New York. 
there's, you know, when he came right away, you could see that he, he kind of was a coach as a player. He had that. Uh, he spoke, he spent a lot of time talking to young players and every, he became like a leader of our team right away on a good team, which is hard to do. And, uh, and he just had so many things going for him. You could just feel it. And so I, I actually offered him the job in Hartford when he, when he quit playing the head job. Um, and uh, he thought about it and then he came back to me and said, listen, I got to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to coach my kids. So just kind of went away, but he said, you know, whatever happens down the road, keep me in mind, you know, at the NHL level, I, this might be something I would think of. And then, you know, as Kent always talked about Marty that way and they have history, right? Their kids played together and, and they went away together with the U S program. And um, so there's a lot of history. Those guys became really good friends. And uh you know, when, when we were here and Kent came in and, and we were struggling and the energy in the room and everything was bad, we just started talking like, what do you think Marty could do? And uh, so that's kind of how it evolved. Um, you know, then we, we, we spent some time and met with him. And, you know, of course, you know, it's not lost on me where he was coaching and the level he was coaching. It's just that when you're with him and you talk hockey with him, you just say, well, it's hockey, right? He's hockey whatever level it is i just thought you know and ken thought uh that nhl players could 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 really see see his approach and understand why he'd be successful and if you were ever in his first meeting with the team you know he i heard about all, this he covered it all you know he went in and he basically told the guys uh, there's nobody in this room that i can't identify with uh, you know i was a guy that was never drafted and i'm sure there's some of you in this room you know, I was a guy that got waved and sent to the minors. I'm sure people like that are in this room, you know. And I was a guy in the fourth line. I, I thought I should have been on the third line. And then I'm sure there's some of you in the room. And then he said, and then I was a second liner. And I'm sure there's some of you. And then I was a first liner. Then I was an all-star. Then I won a cup and, and some trophies. So I don't think there's anyone in here I can't identify with. And I felt from the moment he said that and that's that, that discussion he had with his group, I said, wow, he's got it. You know, where you're like, hey, can you still run the power play? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Make him like a Reg Dunlop. <laughs> I mean, you've seen him. He, I think he could. <laughs> yeah, I know, he's right? In pretty good shape. Uh, so, you, you you get the coach in place. Now you got to put the pieces together. And I, I guess it, it, it can be pretty daunting. And, but you start with a kind of a clean slate. You come in, you assess everything. When you came in. And you looked at this team off to the uh, worst start in the history of the team, and you're looking at this team. Um, what's going through your mind, and, and and where do you start? Say it, you and, and and Jeff, where do you start, and 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 in turning this thing around? Yeah, I I mean I remember coming in um, even before Kent came in, just you know the energy. Listen, it's a team that had gone to the Stanley Cup Finals, for, you know. And I get it. People say, well, they came through this way. They did this, that lightning in a bottle. Yeah. But they went to the Stanley cup Finals, So, you know, there's players there, you know, you know, Carrie was there, you knew there's things. And then you look at it and they had COVID issues and a lot of injuries with Shay and Carrie. Um, so I was just really going in there and trying to figure out, you know, what, who was going to be able to be here in long term, Right. So I just felt like we, there needed to be some kind of shift in, in the youth movement of the team. I, there was probably a lot of time spent trying to win, trying to win, rightly so. And then, so I just felt like right away, we needed to, we need to find some young players to kind of, and I've been part of these organizations, a couple of them where we, when you start bringing in young players that can play, it really lifts the organization up, right? And uh, so just the energy level of the group, I think they were all in shock when we got there, especially when I first got there. It was a bad, you know, the team was bad. They'd run into the ground and the energy level when you walked in that building was tough. Uh, so really, I really wanted to create some kind of energy level, positive things happening where we could just turn it around, right? That's what we wanted. So Berge really uh, making that deal with Pacioretty and bringing Suzuki in. And here's this young kid comes in and, I remember his first camp, he was kind of deer in the headlights and, you know, he went back to junior, went to the Memorial Cup, and then he comes in here. You know, um, certainly proved himself. He, he has that personality that um, it looks like he doesn't let a whole lot bother him. 
uh, he's pretty level, which is so cool here because of the pressure uh, uh, of this fan base, the media, and everything. I, I think certainly he's capable. What goes into that decision to, and I obviously you believe in naming a captain instead of letting the guys vote because sometimes it can be popularity contests. Uh, what goes into that decision? It's the, the youth of this team and here's the guy who's going to lead the way. This is the guy we chose. Uh, maybe overlooking a guy like Brendan Gallagher who's been he- here for years and has given his heart and soul and body to this organization, like a lot of guys I haven't seen in a long time. But what goes into that decision, and how difficult was it to overlook? Not overlook, but name Suzuki over Brendan. Yeah, of course. Like uh, When you look around the league and you think of captains, you just think history of the game. You know, Gallagher has so many uh, attributes of a captain. And the way he's laid it out, I mean, I, I always think of that. There's a photo or uh, a video of him in the finals uh, a couple of years ago with the blood flowing off of him. I mean, that's, that's old school. That's hockey. Right. That's right. Who doesn't want to follow that? So there, no question. And I, I think a little bit of luxury. We have some players here that have ability to be a captain in the National Hockey League. Uh, but when we looked big picture, um, we sat down uh, as an organization. Um, with the people that make the decisions and uh, we just thought about you know do we want a captain we want to name a captain for one year for you know two, and then do it again and or whatever uh, and we talked a lot to our players about who they thought you know might be good we talked to people that have played here uh, recently you know um, had their input about you know the players uh, involved so we, we did a lot of homework we thought a lot about it um, the more we kept, uh, it kept coming back to Nick is what we want to do and how we're building it. Um, we just felt like uh, he was ready, and he's and he's certainly you know he's he's got a contract that's going to be here. He's a very good player. Um, it all fit, you know, like changing captain all the time. I, I just think that's uh, it's not necessarily the way we wanted to go. Um, but but having said that, um, I think that uh, Marty and Kent. Um, you know, they, they did, they, they were smart. They, they, they pushed and said, we need to get to Brendan right away and talk to him and show him the respect. Yeah. Um, and and they did that and spent a lot of time with him, talking to him about it. And he was, he was great. You know, he's, he's an amazing guy. Like he's very impressive. Yeah, guy. He is. I was going to say that he probably was right on board from, you know, he just seems like, you know, accepted. Yeah. He seems like an awesome yeah. guy for sure. I would say within the first, you know, 30 seconds, he was like, yep, whatever you need, you know, that's just who he is. Right. Um, there probably had to be a part of him that, of course, wants to be captain of the Montreal Canadiens. Who, who wouldn't want that opportunity? Um, but what an infectious personality and, and what a guy to have for Nick to have, right? So, um, And then we had talked to uh, Joel Edmondson, too, about it. And, um, and some other guys on the team that, that we felt deserved the respect to know um, why we were doing it. And we wanted them to know that they were a big part of it and, and why we were doing it. So it... it, it uh, so far, so good, and uh, you know we haven't played any games yet. But Nick, you know, pretty unanimously uh, by our group was was the guy. Yeah, he's a wonderful young kid. I haven't got to speak with him, and I, it's funny. I spoke with Brennan the other day at the golf tournament, and you know, I said, "How you doing?" And, you know, I was kind of, I was pulling for you for sure. I love this kid. I've seen him since the day he came here, and I love them the way he played. And he said, "Knox, you know, and." I'm going to support this kid any way I can. And, you know, I, I certainly understand it. So like, I, 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 yeah, I expected exactly what he said to me. I, I, I knew the answer before I asked the question. So, but I, I, I had to speak with him about, it. I just think that's awesome. Now I, I certainly the short time we've met and it's nice because when you come in and, 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 Jeff Hughes, it's, it's some, so much a better feeling with the alumni now. And you guys had us all come in and, you know, we met and we talked and we shot the breeze. And, and just being at that tournament the other day, you could feel a difference. And I'm not throwing shade at Bergie, but it, it was different with him. He, had, he would seem like to stay. At, it's almost like he didn't want the guys around because it put too much pressure on the, the kids. Like all these guys want Stanley Cups and they don't need the pressure. They have enough, but 
But that being said, I remember when I came here, Jeff, you know, Rocket Rashad coming in the room, John Beliveau all the time, Dickie Moore, like they were always around, Toad Blake coming in the room and guys talked to them. It was, and I know things are different and it's, yeah, yeah. Like it was, it was incredible. But it, it, I think for the alumni here, it's just you guys coming in here have, have made it more welcoming. And guys know, believe me, guys know their place. But that being said, having that opportunity, and and now I'm going to go to the draft. And the night before the draft, I come up to you and I'm trying to squeeze you. And you give me the, well, fine, I get it. And then just for the next night, just before you're going out, you – I asked you what's up, and you said, "Well, we got to get bigger." And I just thought that was so cool. I get it. And what about the the center ice position? Don't you need a center? And you said, "Well, I'm gonna take got something in store for that too." And I thought that was so cool. And I I never said a word, and I went up there in the booth and I watched you pick and shock everybody, Slavkovsky. And I just everybody was like, "Oh, the place went." Yeah. They were shocked. Now, that confidence you have and that, and again, drafting by need or drafting by best player, um, what went into that decision? Um, I think in hockey, I think, I think by need is dangerous because generally speaking, you know, we're talking the first pick overall is a little different, but generally speaking, guys are – they're a little ways away from playing and really, really having an impact. So it's not like the NFL where I could sit there and say, all right, we need a defensive tackle. And then they come in and they play right away. Right. I need a quarterback. I need a safety. Uh, In our sport, there's no, we don't have, you know, 26 different positions. Right. And we have goalie, we need D we need forwards to center. Right. So we know what the most impactful positions are right over time. Right. We know that the goalie has a pretty good impact in the game and, Offensive defensemen and, and, and really good defensemen that could play big minutes. Center icemen are huge. We do know that. But for this, you know, we just felt like he was uh, the player that had an ability to be really, really good, right, to be the best player. Uh, so uh, that went into it. His, his personality is a big part, right? I just feel like he's somebody that could deal with it, and our whole group felt that way. So all of that goes into it. And, uh, you know, I think you could see that that night was an incredible night. If you're in that building, um, just like the fans made it so, so special and everything like was almost theater. Right. Uh, from the moment Kent, you know, announced the pick, uh, it was very dramatic. Right. They you could feel that they wanted something else. And then all of a sudden they feel, oh, he's ours. And then they just turned and and they got behind him. And then by the time he went and did his interview and walked through the crowd, you know, it was an amazing response from the fans, and we all felt that. It was, it was great. And then we had, of course, the right before, you know, the fourth pick there, that we announced the pick for uh, the trade. And then to see the faces in the crowd and the, everyone's kind of like – Everybody what? loved you know? that kid Romanoff, <laughs> yeah. right? I, I and, love them. We love it's a, them. Right. It's a tough guy to give absolutely, up. but Absolutely. And everyone's like, oh, my God, what are they doing? What are they doing? And then all of a sudden they're like, a like, Kirby Doc, and then they're hugging and they got a Kirby Doc. So. <laughs> It was uh, it was great. Like uh, you know, we should always have the draft in Montreal. Like based on that, that based on that week, uh, you know, the city put on such a show. The, the organization was incredible. Uh, all the work and effort they all put into it and make it special. So like like everything else they do in Montreal. So uh, it was great. Uh, it, you know, everybody in hockey talks. Everybody I talked to is like, we should always have the draft in Montreal. That's you know, from from you know seeing everybody out to dinners and, and just getting that vibe of, of a draft and what's going on in the NHL. It's, it was a really fun time. Do you, I think you mentioned this early on, like speaking of drafting, like, um, you know, if a player doesn't pan out, like then you start looking at who you missed. Is that, is that just a natural thing? Probably I'm assuming that you end up doing. Yeah. Well, you know, scouts are funny people, right? We all, every year, this I is want my year. guy. I want my yeah. guy. So, you know, there's an evolution of a scout where like, Next year's draft is the draft, right? That's that, that, every time, right? And then as you get closer, you're like, oh, these guys, it's not as good as I thought. And, but, and then they go back to right before the draft, when you sit down with them, they put up all their names and they're like, these 30 guys are, they're all playing. These are the greatest guys, right? And then I always say to them, you know, buzzkill, 
I'll say to them, okay, let's pull any year's draft. Let's take out the top 30 and I'll show you 15 that don't turn out. And they're like, and then they start like, geez, was he so. And so you got like said, Zetterberg yeah. going in like the seventh yeah. round or whatever. Yeah. Datsu going in the fourth, yeah. you know. Yeah. There, there's all, there's great stories about that. So anybody said, ah, he traded away a seventh round pick. Well, you know, you know, you win the lottery too sometimes. So, um, I won't keep it much longer. I just got a few more here. Uh, this is such a treat to have you. Um, Slavkovsky, um, when did you make that decision? Like in your mind, say, this is the guy I'm taking. Was it a week before? Was it a month before? Was it the night before? Was it just before you went out? That's a good question. I, I believe that we made the decision the day before, right? We, we, I would say, listen, it was turning that way for Slavkovsky for a little bit, right, for a while. We certainly had the, you know, the people that uh, at the top of that room making the decisions um, were, were, were very uh, adamant that he was the guy. Um, but also, we, you know, we had some other guys that we liked and at different positions, and we went through that, you know, what do we, what do we want to do and how do we want to move forward over and over and over again. And even to the point where we brought, you know, we brought Slavkovsky in the day of the draft just to talk to him one more time, you know, um, had, had Jeff Molson there too, to, to meet him, to see to what we were seeing and what we were looking at. So, so you're talking to him. What, what, what are those things you ask players that, that kind of help you make that decision? What are some of those questions? Yeah. So on that one, it's, that was a follow up. So we had met him before a couple of times. So really it was like, what have you been doing? And then, you know, sometimes you bring a guy in and, you want to see if they've been working out since the two months ago you saw him, right? But when this guy walks in and he's, you know, you don't really have to ask that question, right? He just, <laughs> he just takes you over work the out. <laughs> You're yeah, just like you yeah, work out. Yeah, it's almost embarrassing. Right? <laughs> okay. So uh, that was much more of like, what have you been doing? You know, just to just to it was more of a just put the stamp on it, so to speak. Okay, but um, what about the inter- introductory yeah. ones? Yeah, you know, so those are the first those are ones. More like uh, the best. You only get it's this was like speed dating a little bit, right? So you get 20 minutes at the combine, the first one. So we got 20 minutes with uh, those guys, and you're asking, you're going through their season as quickly as you can with them. You're trying to learn as much as you can, um, and you're trying to throw some tough ones at them, right? Hey, listen, I was at this game. Um, I felt like this guy was pushing you around, or this and that and that. Did you feel like that? Just to see their reaction. So, you know, and we we have a few guys like Marty Lapointe sits right in front of him. He's a pretty intimidating guy, right? He stays with him right at it. So you're just trying to make them a little uncomfortable in 20 minutes. Um, you know, it doesn't help. I think I've been with some some teams where sometimes it's just too much, too nice. I think the uncomfortability is really good for these guys just to see the reaction. Um, and then, you know, we have taken probably the top five or six guys. We took them all out to dinner in Buffalo. And, and, and that's, you know, that's two hours of, you know, going through, trying to, you know, get through the families. You know, what's your family? You know, what's their impact? Uh, you know, what's your thoughts on other guys, you know, to see how much they know the game You know, what kind of system do you play to make sure that they have some concepts. You'd be surprised. Some guys are like, uh, you know, how do you play in the neutral zone? And they're like, I just play my wing. You know? <laughs> I don't you know, play so, defense. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just trying to get to the, the hockey knowledge, the, the feel for the game, the love of the game, because we all know, the, the, the guys that succeed the most in the game, I, I feel like, are hockey nerds. Hockey nerds, nerds. yeah. Think, you know, you think about Sydney and how much he, the passion, you know. About, they almost have something like yeah. that you either have or you don't. You can't, like, teach it, right? Like, the those guys. Yeah. It's crazy. It yeah. is crazy. I, I just feel like in, in my career, the ones that have the most success, nine times out of ten, are they're, they know everybody in hockey. Like, if you mention a name, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he played for Gatineau. I remember him. Or he, he played out in, in Lulia. They know, right? And some guys you talk to, you like, Where's he from? You know, they don't, they don't know. So Jeff, that decision to get Slavkovsky and not take Shane Wright, uh, did it, was there anything that scared you away from Wright? From Wright? Uh, no, I think he's going to, we all think he's going to be good. Um, you know, everyone gets lost in the fact that, oh, you didn't say Wright, poor Wright, right? But you know, fourth overall is not bad. Right. Like it means he's pretty It means he's really good. He's the fourth best player in the world at his age. That's pretty good. Right. So I never, you know, I thought he was a great kid uh, talking to him, interviewing. We had some really good conversations with him, hard ones 
um, because you know he, he's in a weird spot, right? He he's a dominant guy that got led in the league at 15, a special exception guy, dominant, scored like almost 40 goals at 15. Then there's no hockey, right? And then um, he comes back and he he lit it up in this in the tournament U18s, and then he. He came back and he had a season that he probably wanted 150 points. He got 100, right? So he felt like it was a downer. And we were just trying to get to that and why, uh, you know, wh whether it was the whole being first overall, did that eat away at you? Or th those are the conversations you're asking. But to be honest, we really liked the kid. I thought he was a good kid, and I, I think he'll do fine. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, talking to him. And, and uh, yeah. he, he's, a, he's a hockey nerd. He, he likes he likes hockey. Yeah. Fourth overall, fourth best player in the world. Listen, I was 231st. Does that make me the 231st best player in the world? No freaking way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. True. But when you're uh, in the top 10, it does. Yeah, you yeah, were like, yeah. if you're you just asked somebody, you, Nux, you were like top 20 that year. In the, no, in the, no, come on. Saw you you know said, I'm humble. I think no, I know. Him, right? About that. Um, so, Okay. Moving ahead now with the Habs, you you you, you got to seem like you have a really good base, good core, young players. Um, what um, you know who I I met to the other day? He looked like he belongs in a boy band. Rem Pitlick. Where'd you come up with Rem P Pitlick? Yeah. Like, uh, well, uh, he's interesting. You know, <laughs> you talk about and money. nice kid. Yeah, yeah. Super skilled guy had gone on waivers a couple times and the second time we grabbed him, but truthfully, um, you know, our scouts liked him and Marty wasn't with us yet. And, uh, Kent wasn't with us yet either. And they had both called me and said, Hey, uh, that pit looks on waivers. And Marty told me, he goes, I've seen that guy a lot. I'm telling you there's something there. He had just, just cold called me on him. And, uh, and Kent actually did the same thing. And I'm like, what do you guys talk every day about this? So, and I just called the scouts and they, they were pushing and we had a lot of forwards, right? So it was, uh, you know, do we, do we need another forward? And uh, so I just said, you know what, let's claim them, let's take a shot. And uh, as it turned out, it's, it's ironic that, you know, both Kent and Marty are here and, and, uh, and they, were, they were actually pushing me from the outside to go get them. That's awesome. Um, all right, moving forward. What, and, and well, what does this team need to, let's say, be a consistent playoff team moving forward? Because you know here, everybody wants this team in the playoffs. They just, yeah, they want well, the Stanley Cup, yeah. but so you, let's start with the playoffs. So you're asking as we build it out, or you're saying the seat? What are you saying? What are you yeah, asking? as you build it out. Yeah, well, I think that... Uh, you know, as you look at our team, I, I think it's pretty clear we could use an offensive defenseman that could run our power play. Um, you know, um, an elite kind of guy that uh, that could eat a lot of minutes, could be a power play guy. That's that's something we need. Um, you know, our goaltending issue, we're going to have to – someone's going to have to step to the forefront and be a guy, whether we have him internally or we have to go to the outside. We got to – you know, the best teams have the best goalies, right? Um, there's not a lot of secrets anymore there. Um, and then, you know, I, I think, you know, just adding to the depth and the toughness of our team, right? We could, we could be, you know, as we, as we get, uh, as we move along, we're going to want to be a harder team to play against. Um, so the hardest guys are, are to find the, the skilled ones with, with the, with that grit and that toughness. Yeah. So adding that, I, I'm a really comfortable, I like, you know, Addy Slavkovsky, the man that size, a kid that size, and then Doc, a man that, you know, I like adding that, you know, that component. I just feel like when you get off the bus, you know, you know the, other, the other team's looking. <laughs> That's no when offense. I'm looking. I'm <laughs> looking. I'm like, shit, these guys are huge. Yeah. No offense, Tim, but you want them to get off bigger. And, you know, Glenn, Glenn Saley used to say that to me all the time. He's like, boy, when we get off the bus, we look small. And then I remember we traded for like Brian Boyle, who's, Great guy, and but you know, not tough, not a tough guy. He's played hard enough. He goes, but uh, he goes, he loved to get him when he walked off the bus at six seven. He's like, look at him get off the bus. Yeah, you, know? well, you that's how you told Brian. But you know, we need you to come off the bus. Like yes. Some, you know? yes, look yeah. mean. Yeah, look, look. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So, um, all right, uh, just the last couple of things here. 
uh, the the salary cap. This team is just. Uh, but that's one thing, Berg. He left you in a he left you a, a, in a tough spot dealing with that. How difficult does that make your job now, trying to get this team where you want it with the salary cap? Yeah, like yeah. you up I mean, against. Listen, I, I mean, first of all, you know, Berge gets run down a little bit. You know, too much for me in, in, in Montreal. I think he's done some really good things, and I probably have never said that publicly. But, but I, you know, like the Suzuki trade. There's a lot of really good players that are here because of him, and I and I I don't want to be I, I want to be straight about that. Um, the salary cap. I think that there's there's 20 teams in trouble, or like that are always in trouble, right? So that's not going to go away, especially like in the this year or the next year. And then hopefully there'll be a little bit of relief there, but. You know, for us, uh, we were starting to get out of it a little bit, and then we made a decision, you know, basically to get a first-round pick and, and, and to bet on Sean Monaghan to maybe come back and have a good year and, and see what happens. So, uh, yeah, I think it's always going to be trouble, the, the cap. It's, it's always something you're going to have to deal with, right? You, you're looking at – look at all these young kids that are getting these long-term contracts. So just uh, deciphering who, who gets those and – and and who you build around those are those are tough questions that we're always going to ask but the salary cap i you know i will be fine there's you look around the league every, we always say oh this team's in trouble and they find a way out this team's in trouble you find there's ways to find ways out um so i'm comfortable moving forward that we'll be fine um you know we've made a number of deals like shea weber deal and some things like just to get some cap relief so uh it, it'll always be there it's not the old days where like you could just spend a hundred million and and uh and uh, you know, and that that was that was how you built your team. Um. Lastly, um. Well, no, no, not lastly. Um. <laughs> look at me here. I'm, yeah, this is just I'm, part I'm not one of let this you documentary. Go. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, this season uh, coming up in in this team, uh, do you think? And, and again, I know Price is out. Does Price ever play another game for the Montreal Canadiens? Uh, I mean, I certainly hope so. Uh, I mean, the fact that he's not playing this year is not a great sign um, for us. You know, that he's not going to start the season and that it doesn't look good for this year. So I'm not going to hold out hope that, that it's, that it's going to be great. Um, you know, we'll, we'll probably plan accordingly that we're going to have to move on and, and replace uh, him. Um, so, but I, you know, I go to bed at night thinking that there'll be a miracle and that somehow Carey Price will be our goalie. That would be nice. But, I mean, having played against him, you know, having teams that went against him so long to watch how easy the guy made goaltending look, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. So, uh, so I'm never, I will never close that door that uh, for a miracle, but, uh, right now, you know, it obviously doesn't look great for Carey. And for me, lastly, um, you look awfully comfortable. No shirt, no tie. You got the hoodie on. Did you get that from Belichick? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was He's like, who? Who? I cut the arms off. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm in Buffalo getting ready. We're playing. Uh, we have our we're at rookie camp here. So. Oh, okay. Uh, That's right. Ready. Yeah. That's the, is tonight the first game? Or? Yeah, we play our first game tonight at 7 o'clock. And, oh, God, it's going to be a treat to watch the big guy out there, right? And the rest yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll do everything we can not to put too much pressure on them, though. We'll talk about other guys, too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's going to be exciting to watch that kid. He certainly has that personality for this city, boy. Uh, yeah, he's got the big smile. And, uh, yeah, I remember uh, was Ryan Whitney had sent out a tweet or something. Draft night was pretty funny. Say, I didn't know he looked like that. Of course he's going first overall. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Listen, Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time. And um, I, I'm wishing you nothing but good things here in Montreal. Um, I like what you've done so far and just hopefully you stay on that, that track and, and you bring this, you and Jeff Hughes bring this uh, organization back to uh, the glory that um, it deserves to be. So awesome. I love, stuff. I love how you call him Jeff too, because I, I, He's real. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm oh, gonna Kent! Yeah, Jeez, yeah. I'm, I'm calling you. I know. Kent, he calls me Jim. All I am the time. a knucklehead. I, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to be like Barry. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're rubbing off. Oh my no, god! No, I appreciate your time. I love your story, Jeff. I appreciate. Knuckles. Thank you. Appreciate your time. It's awesome. Knucklehead. Thanks, knuckleheads. Thanks, knuckleheads.
Okay, thanks, Ken. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. Kent Courton. Thank you, Kent Courton.